Hello, everyone, and welcome to Let's Talk HR. Now, today we're actually going to, it's connected to HR, but we're going to talk about learning and development. We're going to talk about different types of learning. And to help me navigate this, we've, I'm joined today by Lee Hawthorne Finch and Lisa from I'm Right HR to really sort of help us go through all the different types of learning that's available, all the benefits of those types of learning and some of the potential drawbacks of those types of learning, because the world isn't a one size fits all. Learning isn't a one size fits all. And we all consume things every day and learn stuff every day. So we're going to try and sort of give you some ideas for different types of learning, different types of engagement that you can give to people today. And, and one of the ways that I try to explain learning to people is if you imagine the human brain's got six million, six billion, sorry, neurons in it. And imagine that's a field of wildflowers. And every time you learn something, you've got a brand new flower connects and that memory and, and you probably go through these experiences in your life we go oh and you suddenly get a memory and it flashes back learning's the process of finding the identity finding your way back to that flower so if you do something repetitively over and over again you get that pathway back to that memory to that specific neuron in that field of six billion wildflowers all unique all different and that's what learning really is and there's different types of learning that you can have whether it be traditional classroom online experiential hands-on you know you do something um, and self-directed and lifelong learning which is where you, you're constantly challenging yourselves and doing things now we're going to start probably just with the importance of learning and why curiosity is so important lee for you why is it so important to just have a, a curious mind and a learning sort of mindset um i think in the simplest well, the answer is because it helps you to achieve your goals. Um, you know, the more you're learning, the more you're going to help you help yourself to achieve your own goals. Um, it's not the, the, you know, learning in a business context, it's not necessarily for the business. It's not necessarily all about compliance training and all that kind of fun. Um, you know, it can also be about you learning to sort of better yourself, be better at the job you do um, at present, um, you know, gain some extra skills or maybe help yourself to move upwards hierarchically whatever your goals might be even to get into a completely different industry i don't know um but you know ultimately you reach your goals and it makes you happy i think that's why it's so important yeah now pearson did an annual report lisa and they found 80 percent of uk businesses believe that skills gap can be reduced with a more emphasis on on lifelong learning and consistent learning within the workplace and having that skill sharing culture you know where people understand what other people do so that when bad times come people can sort of help each other out are you finding that in, in your business you know helping other businesses and, and improving training that actually more general skills is what businesses are looking for at the moment yeah absolutely i actually saw um an article yesterday um that said that one of the reasons why we weathered um the potential recession that was going to happen so well um was because um companies were taking on less skilled workers and training them up and giving them the skills they needed to fill those skills gaps. So, you know, we know there's a war for talent at the moment. Companies are really struggling to find, you know, good people. But actually, companies have been quite adaptable to building this learning culture, um, you know, where they're growing their own talent, which is great because that's something that we've heard for years, isn't it, in HR and L&D? you know, that you've got to kind of grow your own talent and have these pathways. But we are finding as a consultancy that companies are starting to, um, you know, build in really good programmes to help them do that. And I think, Lee, it, there's a lot in this learning culture where it's not about just you're coming into a job to be a car salesman, therefore the only thing you need to know is that exact process of car sales and exactly the steps that you follow. Because if you can understand what the finance department do, what the HR department do, what the IT department do, you can sort of help make things better for everyone by making processes more efficient, by communicating more effectively about why a certain change would have a beneficial impact on you or negative impact and how it connects to everyone else. It's just more informed, more transparent makes for a better performing business, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the more familiarization you've got on the wider business context, the better, particularly any of those um, functions of the business, like you mentioned in that example, um, you know, any any awareness of that is going to be beneficial for you. So you gain the empathy. Um, otherwise, it's really easy to start blaming other people for things that, you know, maybe they've not done rather than thinking about the reasons why they've not done them or, you know, whatever the case may be. But I think in addition to that, it's not just about learning, you know, sales process, 
communication, listening in the salesperson example. It's not just about learning about that wider business context, but let's go even wider than that. I think people are people. Um, you know, whether they're in work, out of work, traveling to work, from work, where, you know, on holiday, as you were discussing earlier, um, people are people. Um, and we don't necessarily get all the life skills that we need from school to be uh, a successful adult, shall we say. And also, we've never experienced change more rapidly than what we are right now. Um, so I think the more that we can assist people to learn about those sort of those things that have nothing to do with work, then the better they're going to perform in work. And then, of course, at home and in the rest of their lives as well. Things like, you know, one of the, things, the examples you used there, James, was change. Well, actually, when do we ever learn about change? And change management and um you know the change curve and things like that i know it's only a basic example but let's have a think about how we can broaden our skills with that maybe something around budgeting at home you know um if someone's just returned from maternity or paternity leave um all of a sudden their household budget is totally different their their time budget is totally different to what it has been before can we help people with that kind of thing um because then you know the, the happier they are the more successful they are the more effective they are at home the better they're going to come to work so the benefits both ways. I think that's a really important, it's a really big point because I, I mean, was I was talking earlier um, on a different stream about some someone Lisa about mental health, and and one of the things that's always going to change is the stresses on you and your personal life, and learning how you can manage your own mental health, how you can manage your own burnout, how you can manage yourself. These are not things that you can just read a book and know how to do. These are experiences that you're going to have to have. And a supportive L and D department, learning department, HR department that is actually able to guide you to the resources that you're experiencing at the time, so that you've got that pathway to that flower, so to speak, is really helpful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, we all learn a lot more than ever before now as well because of social media. So micro learning is is one of the things that we hear a lot more about these days where you just, you know, read a little article a day. You might see, um, you know, just a quote from somebody inspirational, you know, particularly around mental health and well-being. You know, there's so, so many um, people are sharing really good resources around resilience building, um, you know, how to manage yourself. You know, there's charities putting things out there on social media. So I think um, learning is really good for mental health. You know, and then when you're in that moment, being able to access those resources in the moment through social media um, and those type of resources is really helpful. Now, we're going to start by looking at um, something which obviously we do not do as HRC online, but Lee does quite regularly, which is classroom learning and the benefits of classroom learning. For, for you, Lee, what are the what are the benefits of classroom learning? What are the benefits that of getting people in, in an environment together to sort of speed up that learning process? I think that there's a lot of different benefits um, and it depends what kind of learning we're trying to engage in. I mean, the first one I'm going to go to is an induction. I know, again, it's a bit of a basic example, but it's, it's still a really important example. Um, as we all know, people are most engaged in their workplace when they first start. So let's see if we can harness that engagement and extend it for as long as possible. It's a really important time um, of someone's employment journey. Um, so bringing people together to meet other other team members, other, other people around the business is really important to be able to sort of show and display what a business has got to offer. Um, and it's also about, for me, induction, it's not just about the pragmatic kind of stuff, you know, here's how to access your payslip and that kind of thing that is still important. But it's also a good opportunity to get across our company culture, um, which is way more subjective and a lot more difficult to get across in, for example, an e-learning package. I think there's times for e-learning, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, e-learning is very, very important, actually. But there's also some benefits, as you say, to, to doing something face to face. I think the other side to it is maybe the more complex matters, things like leadership development, um, things like anything around mental health, as an example you mentioned as well, DE and I, um, anything around diversity, equity, inclusion, that kind of thing. It's a little bit more complex than if we're trying to persuade someone of something um, where we can actually have a two way, you know, real life two way conversation. Um, and really read each other's body language and actually be able to, to speak properly about something rather than just kind of reading it on the e-learning. If the message is a bit more complex, I think it's a, a little bit better to maybe do that on a face-to-face -face environment. Um, the other benefit is we've never experienced loneliness um, as much as what we have done in the past few years since the pandemic. You know, we've all gone to work from home um, really rapidly and that suited a lot of people, myself included. Um, but also I think there's a few drawbacks to just solely being working from home all the time. 
not knocking working from home. I work from home and I love it. But I think the reason I love it is because at least once a week I manage to get out and go somewhere and, and sort of get that face time with people. Completely agree. And, I, and it's one of those, like, I, I'm obviously at home a lot. And it's it's one of the biggest conversions from me being in the sales office where you get that sort of transient information of people where you're hearing people pitch different things and you can mix more tweaks here and mix more tweaks. Don't hear anything anymore. So mm. my trust levels have to go up um, because obviously if my trust levels go down when I've got people working at a distance, I'm going to be, become a micromanager, which is going to negatively impact someone's mental health because I'm checking how they're saying everything and stuff like that. So sometimes, Lisa, getting people together in a classroom gives not only that manager some you know mental reassurance so that they can build that trust and, and they can have their say and they're not having to nitpick everything, but can also just be that social element where people don't feel like the nuclear in a classroom where lunchtime comes and they don't know who to instant message or jump on a Zoom call with and just have a chat and just sort of vent. It's You need to build that personal relationship sometimes before you feel comfortable enough to go, you've got five minutes for a quick Zoom. Yeah, it, it's really interesting with working from home because I, I'm a big advocate for working from home. And I was before the pandemic. I ran a, a workshop for the CIPD about three months before the pandemic hit um, on how I'd embedded flexible working in my last organisation. So um, in terms of diversity and inclusion, in terms of working carers, you know, there's, there's many, many benefits. But I remember when I started in telesales when I was about 19 um, and I listened to the person next to me and how they sold the franking machine and I repeated what they said and then I got my first sale and I did the same when I worked in insurance you know and, and I do worry that working from home we are missing some of those key um, learning opportunities for people that are newer to the organisation um, you know particularly I've got a 15 year old he's about to start in the workforce in the next few years you know I worry you know how how how's he going to pick up um, you know, things from others when everybody's working so remotely. So I still think there's a real place for bringing people together to learn. Um, and I also think that there's some really clever solutions to that problem that are going to kind of evolve. Yeah, I, I do feel there's going to be a small skills gap as we try and work out how best to sort of convert that classroom, that face-to-face, -face, that working together knowledge transfer into more digital formats and because i don't think everyone's got it right yet so there's probably going to be a bit of a lull um but we're going to talk about you know classroom learning lee give me a give me a, one of your favorite classroom sessions you know the, a session that you run that is sort of you're like you, you enjoy it learners enjoy it it's it, and you know the purpose i guess of the training um, I think probably one of my most favourite, funnily enough, we were just talking about it before the call. I'll move, I'll move my shoulder that way a little bit and you can see my uh, insights discovery blocks. I think anything to do with where we can introduce um, something, I mean, we'll call it personality profile and psychometric profile and whatever we want to call it, whether using insights, MBTI or any of the various other competitors. Um, I think that is a really good one to do face to face. I think a lot of people come into those sessions if they've never heard of psychometrics before, they come into them quite skeptical. I think it's going to be a bit like a horoscope. You know, what is this really going to tell me? I've only spent 10 minutes on the little evaluator. Um, and then when they start to learn about what the benefits of a psychometric um, can do for them and their teams and how they can appreciate the people around them a little bit better and work together a bit more harmoniously, maybe. Um, and then when they get their own profile, you can sort of see those reactions. and. You know, I've had tears in those sessions before because of how accurate things are. And people have talked about the struggles they've had um, either personally, internally or around things like bullying um, in the workplace. That's not really the one thing that sorry, that's not really the kind of thing I just want to be emailing about. I'd rather mm. at the very least pick up the phone. But when you can see that emotion on someone's face in the room. I do understand it might be a little bit, you know, the drawback is it might be a bit unpleasant for them that they're feeling a bit emotional in front of all of their colleagues, which they might not want to do. But if they're going to take themselves out of the room and you can actually have that conversation properly, um, you know, and be able to support them and help them, that's going to be incredibly beneficial where if you just flick your camera off on Teams, I never knew about it because I thought you were answering the door. Um, you know, it, I've seen the benefit of those sessions so many times. I absolutely love delivering it. It's one of my favourite things to do. You're right as well, because you can see if someone doesn't get it in their face a lot of the time. And, and yeah. you can hide that really well on camera because, you know, no one's looking directly down the lens of the camera at all times, whereas they are looking at you as a trainer. 
So if someone looks completely confused, you can probe it out of them. Whereas sometimes with the online stuff, is someone just making notes. You're like, oh, they're just making notes. And actually, they're into messaging someone going, I have no idea what you're talking about. And there's someone else going, me either. Oh, let's just stay quiet and, and move on. Lisa, for you, what about a, a face a, class, a classroom session that you, you enjoy delivering? Oh, well, um, I completely agree on the psychometrics. I do DISC. Uh, you know, competitor to insights, but very similar and, you know, pretty much the same. I sometimes rename the letters as bird spirit animals, and that goes really well. So we have, you know, the hawks and the flamingos and the owls and the swans. Um, and it's great to get the energy in the room. So I usually get everybody standing up on their feet and, you know, we're kind of running around the classroom. Um, one of my, a lot of my sessions, I use Lego or I use Play-Doh or air dry clay. Um, and one of the sessions that I found that works really, really well is an inclusive leadership session. So this is where we'll take leaders through kind of everything they need to know about DNI and being an inclusive leader. Um, and what we do at the start of the session is build a leader out of air dry clay. And then as we learn each, each little bit through the day, we add to that leader. So when we've done employment law, they get a scroll and they get a mortarboard hat um, for the little figure. Um, when we learn about the barriers that prevent um, inclusion, they get a hammer so that they can smash the barriers. When we learn about, um, you know, unconscious bias, microaggressions, they get a pair of glasses so that they can see through the lens of other people. So we do that throughout the session. What I find really um and i didn't i didn't plan this really when i planned the session but what happens is when people are playing with um play-doh and they're kind of fidgeting um they get a lot more open and a lot less defensive and particularly when it's a difficult topic that it really helps to bring people out of themselves in the room the sessions just go so much better fidgeting always helps me yeah something, pens draw, drawing something like that i take um, to every session and because i do a lot with neurodiversity as well i make sure there's always stuff for people to fidget with there we go <laughs> i think for me uh, one of the ones that i quite like is and, and you probably both delivered this at some point is is the change one which is with uh, spaghetti and um play-doh or, or, or blue tack where you ask them to build a bridge and you give them 10 minutes to build this bridge and, and the spaghetti snapping, they're getting frustrated and stuff like that. But they get they start to get there. And with about a minute to go, you go, actually, they want the tallest tower that you can possibly make, not a bridge anymore. And it just shows people how they experience the change curve and how people you wouldn't expect to get angry, get furious and, and, and pastas breaking everywhere. And it's just a really good, fun session because people like scorched earth experience the change and therefore understand what happens to themselves in that sort of change experience. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of that particular type of session because I think that's quite a fun way of sort of making people experience change without them even knowing that it's coming. Um, but we're going to move on from traditional classroom to sort of your online and your e-learning. Uh, many people's first experience or current experience of e-learning is, and Lee's heard me say this about a thousand times, you watch a video about how to lift a box you then get a quiz at the end about which which back position is correct to lift the box and you tick the right one and then you pass it and you get your little completed and it gets sent to HR and then bosh, you know, you're safe to work. In the, and I get there's an element, isn't there, where we need to ensure that everyone's covered the right training so that the company is legally protected. But e-learning doesn't have to be that boring, does it, Lee? Oh, there's Please. a gap because your video, um, your video oh. is way behind your audio. I have to cut oh. this bit out. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. But yeah, e-learning doesn't have to be boring box lifting videos and, and and click quizzes, does it? I think you know what you can get. We were just talking about classroom learning. You can get some really naff classroom learning. You can get some boring classroom learning, and you can get some really good, inspirational, engaging classroom learning. The exact same applies for e-learning. If you do it, do it well. If it's not done well, it's not going to work. Um, funnily enough, I've just signed off on some manual handling training. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, what what's making that proposition um, good for us is how bespoke it is. So we've got a number of different roles uh, across the business. We are a group of car dealerships. We've got everything from parts to technicians, to sales, drivers. Um, and we've had the experts come around and have a look at all the different job roles that they do. And they spent about an hour in the car dealership. It was hardly anything, really, looking at all these different roles and the amount of stuff that they spotted 
that people were not quite doing um, right that could injure their bodies. So rather than let's show you how to lift a box, don't um, you know, don't do your, your back in and that kind of thing, let's have a think about how we can make that a bit more pragmatic for the people that are going to do the learning. So you know we've got training um, for our technicians that is filmed in our workshops on our cars, showing them the things that they are likely to get wrong because we've watched them get it wrong, and then obviously it's about the impact and that kind of thing to get the buy-in. Um, I think e-learning can so easily be a box tick, and to some extent. You know, let's not um, beat around the bush. It is a box tick to some extent. We need to cover us that we have. We can record and prove that we have trained you in uh, health and safety or in GDPR, some form of compliance thing. And, you know, that could be our first line of defense that we've done this training. I think the FCA, which so many businesses um, are FCA regulated, they will require that we do that learning and that we can prove that we've done it um, and what we've done. So that's really important. It is a box tick, but you know, let's think, let's, let's be quite pragmatic about it. And I think so many e-learning, this is my real big thing for e-learning and, and my team um, at Jardine are sick of me saying this over and over again. I don't care what people know at the end of the e-learning. I don't care if they can recite the fine that we're going to get for breaching GDPR or the amount of, I don't know, all these different quantities of consequences. I don't care what people know at the end of the e-learning. I care what they can do at the end of the e-learning. I don't want to test their abilities on whether they can recite um, regulations from the FCA. I want them to be able to actually protect our customers' data. Not to say they can protect the customers' data. I want them to protect the customers' data. Um, you know, I want them to be able to actually lift, um, I don't know, whatever implement of a car it is. I'm not that technically minded, um, you know, without injuring themselves and end up, you know, in a wheelchair at the age of 50 or 60. Um, you know, that there's actually some importance to it. So let's focus that either on what people are then going to go and literally do with themselves after, um, rather than just reciting some some fines or something like that that they just don't need to know. I completely agree. And, and I think one of the for me, one of the perks of e-learning is, is is it's a path that can be trodden over and over again. You can reinforce it and you can go back over it. Whereas you don't know how much someone's taken in. In, in a classroom session that might be the element that they've forgotten they'll have forgotten a lot of it by the end of it whereas you, again it's it's the path repeat repeatedly trodden you can say it in multiple ways a bit like mbti when you do the quiz it asks the same question just words it differently and it introduces you in different ways so that you're actually challenged in your own thinking for you lisa what 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 do you see as the benefits of online learning and e-learning in comparison to let's say a classroom course I mean, I, I think there's lots of benefits. Um, I, I'm a big um, believer in when you've got a group of people together, and I do predominantly management and leadership training. So when you've spent the money to get your leaders and your managers together, and they've all had a whole day out of the organisation, and you take into account the costs of, you know, my time training, all of those leaders' time, the time arranging it, those days are, are expensive. They're worth a lot of money. You know, and for me, the, the value comes from bringing those brains together, problem solving, brainstorming, you know, the energy in the room. And I, and I think that that is wasted if you're learning stuff that can be learned on an e-learning platform, um, you know, just as easily. So I think there is two, there's two types of learning, really. And I think one of them suits really well to kind of online and e-learning, um, you know, which is where that person has just got to absorb that information. You know, and actually classroom learning for me is, is about much more than that. It's about developing those relationships and, you know, bringing people together. Um, I also think um, th there's a big evolution in e-learning. I think there has been over the last couple of years, and I think it's still happening. Um, adaptive e-learning is something that I'm seeing a lot more, and I absolutely love that. I always think back to, um, I don't know if you two as, as, as men read the books when you were younger, that at the end of the chapter, you had a choice where you could go to this chapter or that chapter. I don't know whether they were more like Enid Blight and girly books, but I love I loved that concept of, you know, you've got a bit of choice in there. And I'm starting to see that come through in e-learning of, you know, you've got a choice of you can do a quiz or you can watch a video or you can write a paragraph. And AI can now, um, you know, look at your paragraph and tell you whether that's, you know, what it was looking for or not. So I think those are really exciting developments. Yeah, it was like a Dungeons and Dragons book that from I remember, I remember it and you're going through it and you, you see <laughs> You go into the cave, do you go left and go to page four? Do you go right and go to page six? And then this is what you're confronted with, an ogre or a dragon, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and those are really good. Um, I think 
I think you both explained it really well. And I think from my experience from a, from an online learning perspective, because it's been a large portion of, of my career is, is it depends on how you're being assessed. And, and I say that because if it's an exam and you, and you're under pressure to recall an exam is, is a memory test to a degree, you're learning a lot of information and you have to recall it in a pressurized environment. So you need to repeat that pressurized process over and over again so that you feel comfortable walking into that and you're at a higher state of confidence. Now you need some element of face-to-face -face which you can deliver via webinar, one-to-one -one conversations, but repeating that process over and over again, sometimes e-learning pushes you to be more ready than let's say a classroom course would be if you had a class and then four weeks later you've got your exam being able to do that on repeat helps people prepare. So I think it depends on the assessment methodology. If you're trying to, again, in, induct people into a business and help them build relationships and, and help them understand who their team is and where to go for support and how to build rapport and relationships, e-learning is probably not the right thing to do. If you're asking people to learn where to find the right solution for a GDPR inquiry, or a GDPR question and stuff like that, if they know where the e-learning is and they know what the process is and they know how to go back and find it, well, probably e-learning is best because they can go, oh, I don't need to bother X, Y, Z. I know how to find it and this is how we do it. So for me, it's it's all about thinking at the end, what what's the process at the end? Is it is it as an exam? Is it a dissertation? Is it something like that? And how best do we path that back? But I, I, I think you both said that. Um, and it's just about finding the right mechanism for the right mm -hmm. situation. And yeah. online, this, for example, is online learning, I guess, which is us face to face chatting. So I was just going to say as well, the just in time learning as well. Yeah. That's something that has to be, you know, accessible in the moment. You know, suddenly I need to go and have a difficult conversation and I can't remember anything from the course I did 18 months ago. But I can watch this quick four minute video on it. I think that's that's really valuable. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we are learning when it comes to, to sort of online learning is that timings are a lot shorter. Mm -hmm. Like if you want if you people want to learn stuff on YouTube, it's a 10 minute video. That that's what everyone expects, you know. So you can't have someone for eight hours, you can have ten minutes. If you want to watch someone wants to listen to an AI talk through something or a basic principle, it's a minute because that's the maximum, you know, that's the average duration of TikToks where you've got people reading through content and stuff like that. So it again, it depends on the attention, I guess, that you're trying to hold people for um, because people can't sit in front of a screen for six hours, eight hours and, and, and learn. Um, I've tried to sit through all three Lord of the Rings films in one day, it doesn't work. And they're great films. And my e-learning content, as good as it is, it's not Lord of the Rings level. <laughs> you just need more tenacity. <laughs> I do. I need the dawn to come up. <laughs> In the final hour, the dawn comes up, the sun comes up. But no, um, or I can't afford any of the actors to do the talking for me. But <laughs> it, It's true, isn't it? It's, it's about finding the right mechanism for the right. The point stands, James. I think I, I've learned more um, from TikTok probably in about a total of nine minutes worth of video about Microsoft PowerPoint. Bearing in mind, I've been using Microsoft PowerPoint since I was 12 year old, and I'm not going to say how long ago that was, but it's a substantial time away. Um, and um, I've learned more about PowerPoint. I can make some really good, impressive PowerPoints now from this nine minutes of probably in your know, total of TikTok on these little micro learn um, bursts. But to answer your question, though, James, about assessment, I'm actually going to challenge the concepts of why we're why we're assessing people. Um, particularly, you mentioned exams at the start there. Mm. Not a lot of jobs that we're going to train people to do are going to need them to sit in a room on their own and choose for a multiple choice um load of questions and um, that isn't what they're going to do on their day-to-day -day basis in their jobs um so i kind of question why we're assessing people in that way why don't we assess them on being able to do i know i'm going back to my point but why are we why don't we assess people on what they're actually going to go and do with that knowledge um now i'm not suggesting 
that we sit and watch everyone, uh, you know, lift the box, as it were, or we assess everyone on a mock phone call in a call centre for the GDPR or anything like that. Um, but Lisa, you know, I'm guessing that some of the, the leadership and management development work that you do, we don't assess people with a, um, a multiple choice question at the end necessarily. We usually assess them on what they're actually going to do with that knowledge. What are they going to promise us to do differently afterwards? Mm-hmm. Um the video is a little bit delayed for me and I got really concerned then at the timing of when you said no then <laughs> I thought you were telling me I'd got it completely wrong <laughs> no I was agreeing <laughs> um but um the, the other thing with assessment is does it have to assess um what they've learned from that piece of learning so what I'm really pleased to be putting in place um, in the business that I work for um, at the moment with cyber security, which is very important for every business you know, at the moment, um, is let's assess people before they've done the training. Because why am I going to get them to spend 40 minutes of their lives doing cyber security training when they've worked in six different businesses in the past, in the past, sorry, that have all trained them on cyber security? It's not rapidly different. We've got a red and yellow banner, like every business has got a red and yellow banner. Don't click on attachments like you don't know what they are, is the perfect summary, isn't it? Let's assess them on whether they know how to protect our business and protect themselves before we make them sit through that learning that they already know. This is why people get so turned off by e-learning because they think, oh, I've done this already. I already know. Red and yellow banner. Yeah, sure. Move on. <laughs> don't need to the spend amount of people on. I have heard say, why can't I do the test first? And if I fail, Fair enough. I'll do the training. It, it seems counterintuitive. And I think to, to your other point in terms of assessments, exams, stuff like that, it's, it's these, it, a lot of the times it's bodies, isn't it? Wanting to, to regulate that people have learned the sufficient level. But we're getting into a weird territory now where AI can write stuff. So I, I'm, I'm knocking back assessments left, right and centre for AI involvement in the writing um a, a percentage way higher than than i would like it to be because people just put the question into chat GBT and it pumps out an answer now i have an ai tracker and it identifies it and it, and it sends it back so they've not necessarily learned but they've not necessarily not learned but i don't know yeah. and we're getting into this territory now where do you go to formal exams like the written ones where you set the question in an exam and you, you, get, you write for three and a half hours but who writes for three and a half hours nowadays you can do it typed, but or you could look at the apprenticeship, which is an assessment center, which is a scenario based conversation, which is where I think we probably need to start going when it comes to these types of situations, because you could still load up a chat bot and, and you could create AI to test some of the basic stuff and then have a more holistic conversation at the end. And it, and it becomes really interesting debate about what the future of education is going to be, because GCSEs now, who sits down and writes for an hour, two hours with their hand? Like, I don't think I could sit down and write for two hours, and my handwriting is terrible. It was bad before, but it's even worse because I, I don't write anything anymore. So it, I think it becomes really interesting when you start to think about how things are assessed moving forward and what changes that's going to be and what is the purpose of that learning. Like The purpose of the HR qualifications, when you really drill it down, is to understand where to get research from to make informed decisions. So if you're trying to implement a well-being strategy, where do I find research on well-being? What is well-being? What is the good literature on it? How do I implement it? That's what you're learning if it's a well-being module. If it's an L&D module, that is, how do I build a good learning platform? What is the right mode of delivery? How do I research that and make an informed decision? So it's going to get really interesting over the next few years. I think there's a lot of change coming into the the learning sector and learning sector as a whole and the qualification sector as a whole, where we people just put CIPD qualification as a, as a requirement when actually what does that mean skills wise, which a lot of companies probably can't answer. Um, which kind of takes on to like that experiential assessment and that self-directed learning, lifelong learning. Um, Lisa and, and and a lot of this, a lot of your managerial costs, if you think about it, is situational leadership mm-hmm. problems, mm-hmm. and you have leaders telling each other leaders how to do it. Sometimes there'll be problems where you bring people together and someone's in charge of that particular scenario. And how did they lead that scenario? How could they improve it? And that sort of hands-on learning is really important, isn't it, in terms of peer-to-peer learning and how you work together. 
Yeah, hugely so. Um, I mean, it, it, schools are very different to how we, um, you know, how we run L&D in, in businesses, um, because when you're at school, the type of learning, the pedagogy that they've got is somebody stood at the front of the classroom and yeah. imagine everybody in there is an empty vessel. That they have to fill with knowledge. And that's, you know, that's the approach. When you um, when you're training adults, when you're doing work with adults in terms of L&D, um, I always see my role as a facilitator because there's not one empty vessel in that room. Every person that's coming in there, um, regardless of whether an employee, manager, leader, what stage they're at, is bringing their life experiences. Um, and we all know we've been sat in training rooms where you've got an expert at the front and you're sat, sat there thinking, I could really add some value to this, but I don't have a chance because they're, you know, they're training me. Um, so um, looking at kind of Kolb's experiential learning cycle, I tend to follow that with a lot of the programs that I create. And that is kind of understand the concept, experience the concept, just like you were saying with that chain of management um you know the lego or the spaghetti whatever you use you know you experience it you know and then you kind of re retrospectively review it um you know and then it goes in the cycle but i always see myself as a facilitator and facilitating that knowledge to come out of other people and for them to learn peer to peer so um all my courses are designed in terms of kind of the tasks and how people can work together in groups and learn off each other you know and then continue that learning after it as well and Lee, I assume I, I'm I'm just assuming Jardin Motors mentorships, you know, someone who's been working there for a long period of time, shall we say, in the garage or something like that, apprentices coming in. I assume mentorships are a really important part of that sort of hands-on experience learning, which there's no curriculum for understanding that this particular car's got this particular weird thing that you need to do to be able to do X, Y, and Z. It's it's again, it's having good middle manager or experienced staff that are open and honest about how they want to help others. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we're really lucky with our, um, well, we're not lucky we put it in place, but we are a really good mentorship program. Um, so for me, it kind of falls in two sides that there actually is that sort of technician um, side. You know, if you're a vehicle technician, the manufacturers, um, uh, you know, for example, Audi, BMW, whoever, um, they'll run an apprenticeship. So you've got that sort of trained to be a, a technician kind of situation, but that will come with a mentor who will help someone for when something falls outside of scope is probably the easiest way to summarise it. And cars, the same as people, you know, they're always throwing up some sort of error error message um, that, you know, falls outside of the training. Um, but what we use uh, mentoring for in a completely different capacity then is our apprenticeships around leadership. And I think this is something we do really, really well. And I can't take any credit for it whatsoever because it's not me that's done it. And um, we've got a fantastic um, head of leadership development and a really supportive chief people officer who um, have put some fantastic um, L&D in place for, for various different levels of leadership development um, that really also are embedded with our culture. Um, and then that would come with a really good mentoring programme, um, again, to assess with that sort of people side. When you get the error message, the error code, um, you know, on the people side of things, um, you know, how you can deal with that on a more on a more nuanced level. Because, again, it's it's about culture, isn't it? It's about, you know, some of the motor industry will do it this way. Some businesses outside of our industry will do it another way. And actually, we do it this way because this is the reason why. Um, so, you know, you might have 10 years in the motor trade and actually, you know, to be a really good technician. So we're going to recognize that achievement. But you haven't got 10 years experience maybe as a people manager and maybe you haven't got 10 years experience in in our particular business. And we do things a little bit differently. Um, so it's about having that mentor for um, those more subjective times and maybe more emotive times as well. So you have to recognize learning is often gonna, good. Oh, sorry, often going to have some emotion attached to it as well, isn't it? Yeah, I often find least that in the like the experiential the hands-on learning and stuff like that it's there needs to be that constant communication back and forth in there in terms of understanding what what's worked well what's not worked well who struggled with what who's done well with what and if you have an open communication where someone can say do you know what i found this really easy to explain this particular thing but i did i got really I didn't feel comfortable telling them I need to turn up on time. I didn't feel comfortable telling them this and that and the other, but I felt comfortable telling them technically what they need to do. Well, actually, then you can support them to to help sort of round out their own skills as well. But it's not a it's not a syllabus. It's not a pedagogy. It's just good communication, mentoring, and coaching, isn't it? Yeah, 
Yeah, and it's that learning environment. So my background was working in a college, and that is, you know, it's a learning environment. It's what it's it's the core business of what they do. Um, you know, and, and people used used to have a concept that learning came from HR and it came in a course. You know, so learning is, you know, I sit down in the classroom and someone teaches me something. But, you know, if you look at that 70, 20, 10 model, 10 percent of learning is that classroom based type learning. You know, the other 90 percent is learning off other people. So, you know, if you've ever been promoted to being a manager. So, you know, suddenly you're in a, you're in a team, you're doing really well, you're great at your job. Then suddenly you're a manager overnight. Um, you know, and everyone makes mistakes in those first couple of years. When you look back, you go, oh, you know, I can't believe that I, you know, I went so hard on that person. And, you know, the repercussions were this or I let that person get go on for so long because I didn't know how to tackle it. Um, you know, and you, you, it's, it's that kind of having a network of other managers who you can say, how did you tackle this situation? Because I'm finding it difficult. And people are people. No two issues with people are ever going to be the same. You know, people have been in HR 20, 30 years and you'll still see things you've never seen. <laughs> Some of the stories are great as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but having that network around you and having that learning environment, you know, where people are quite happy to, to mentor you, to coach you, um, you know, the, the other stuff is accessible as and when you need it, other learning. And that makes a difference. Now, conscious time, so we're going to move on to the last part, which is self-directed and lifelong learning. Um, so, Lee, you were saying that one of the things you're learning at the moment is PowerPoint skills via TikTok. <laughs> but it just shows how people are consuming information, doesn't it? It shows how people are trying to find solutions to problems. You, I, you know, I, I started my working life in, in a world before Google, which was horrible to think about. And, and finding solutions would be speak to people and stuff like that. Now you can research, you can find answers. And actually, how much time do we spend teaching people where they can find their own answers and how they can empower themselves in their lifelong learning? I think people are getting a lot better at it now, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the biggest challenge to it, um, I imagine every, every I was going to say every learner, every employee, every staff member of every business out there, um, the biggest challenge um, to that self-directed learning is time. Um, and I suppose there's the old proverb, isn't there? You have to spend money to make money. Um, but the same with uh, with time. You have to spend time to make time. Um, you um, you know, if you take 10 minutes out of your day, uh, Lisa's mentioned some micro learning there. You're absolutely right. There's loads of micro learning out, out there, whether that's on social media, it's not just TikTok, whether it's on um, just from Googling, whether it's from scan a QR code next to your screen to learn how to use this particular system. Um, you know, whatever the micro learning is, uh, taking that 10 minutes out of your day might actually save you an hour the next day or two hours the next day because you were doing something maybe efficiently or you didn't know how to do it or you weren't getting the sales that you your colleagues next to you were getting um and sometimes it's a bit longer sometimes it's more than 10 minutes sometimes you do need to sit down with a good i don't know an hour long e-learning or a podcast or a, uh, some sort of systems training but i think this is probably a message to managers as well isn't it it's not just about people and self-directed um learning it's a message to managers um if you've got a sales floor that's underperforming um I've seen people cancel sales training before because the sales were underperforming, so we need all hands on deck. But the point of doing the sales training is the fact that the people don't necessarily know the best way how to sell. So maybe we need to take them off the floor, take that little hit for half a day, whatever it is a day, however long we're going to do it. And um, then they'll come back and be able to do a little bit better and feel a bit motivated as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People undervalue that the, even even if you take the training away, not that like your training's not spectacularly, I'm sure it is, but so just taking the pressure off for a day, you know, taking a break, stuff like that, has so much beneficial impact. And it, and it's, I think sometimes people just want quantifiables and guaranteed data, and and I think sometimes in this in this world of, of social media, Lisa, there's there's so much false information out there, there's so much wrong information, and there's so much mm -hmm. quantifiables and people trying to convert everything into a statistical format. Well, actually, unfortunately, people are not robots and zeros and ones and stuff like that. And whilst you can use a lot of zeros and ones to make a lot of informed decisions, it's never quite as clean and simple as that, especially when it comes to self-directed learning, is it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I've got to say, when I was um, writing the people strategy in my last employed role, um, I would say probably 50 to 60% of that was based on L&D and people learning because it is the biggest thing that can make a difference. The world we live in, you need to keep up with, you know, I mean, AI, I mean, look at how it's, you know, had we had we really even heard of chat GPT, you know, a year ago? I mean, look at how fast the world's evolving. You know, if your business isn't learning at the pace that the world is changing, then you're going to get left behind. It's hugely important. Um, not just that, but learning's great for um, retaining great talent. You know, so there's this big talent war at the moment. Um, it's great for uh, ensuring people have got an adaptability, a growth mindset. You know, so if you do need to kind of pivot your business, you've got people that can do that with you. So it's, it's the number one thing that's important. But being able to show that return on investment, you do have to get creative because you can't say, I'm going to spend on this course and this is going to make this money. You know, you have to say, well, actually, it's going to reduce absence because people are happier. We're going to spend less on recruitment and retention. Um, you know, it's going to make us more adaptable in the future. It's going to increase engagement and productivity. You've got to kind of um, look at it a, a little bit wider than that. Now, we're going to move into some of the unpopular opinions with regards to learning that I've found. And I'm going to come to you for the first one, Lee, because I think it connects to the self-directed learning. It's, and that's with all the knowledge, information, things at your fingertips, micro learning and stuff like that, some of it's great, some of it's wrong. People are getting stuck in just trying to change everything and not being static enough to learn and, and, and master a particular basic. How do you as an L&D manager go, well, change one thing, see if it works, change another thing, see if it works, as opposed to just changing everything constantly and never being able to see growth? How do you manage people that are just so curious that they get lost in all this new information and stuff? I think we've got to focus on the goal. Um, I think there's a lot of career hopping for, you know, I think what you just described, I suppose, career hopping, particularly with people in the very early stage of their careers. Um, but, you know, that's not a bad thing to figure out what you actually want to do and what you enjoy. Um, you know, not a lot of people will leave school or college and immediately go into the industry that they've always wanted to do because a lot of people don't know what that industry is. Um, you know, when I first started out, I did a little bit of time in a hotel, really enjoyed food service, really enjoyed a passion for other customers. Um, I did a little bit of time in banking. I actually quite enjoyed that as well. I spent a bit of time uh, as cabin crew and all of those different experiences, which actually with a lot of years, um, you know, it kind of led to me feeling like, could I ever do anything more than a customer service job in some way? But it also really informed my training ability. Um, you know, nearly every business has got customers, hasn't it? So you need some kind of customer experience. It's really benefited me now, um, working in a premium luxury business, able to train that. So I actually don't think there's a bad thing, um, you know, in learning as much as you can. And then eventually at some point, once you've experienced all these different things, maybe as a young person, um, then you, you start to think about, well, what are your goals? What have you really enjoyed? What's going to be the most lucrative for you? Not just financially lucrative, but um, you know what's going to support you and what's important to your life? Do you want a family? Do you want to travel? Do you want to live away from, either away from the city you were brought up in or um, in a different country? What, you know, what do you want to experience in your life? And then you, know, you can direct your learning and your career in that kind of way. But And the same actually applies for managers as well. I think what you described there, I think was a little bit different to what I was thinking initially, which is um, training can very easily lose its way and then become not so valuable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of that training needs analysis and that scoping conversation, that, that's absolutely key. We need to know what are we trying to achieve in this business um, or in this department, whether that's something customer facing, whether it's around leadership, whether it's around a bit of team building, I don't know, whatever it might be. Um, what are we actually trying to achieve? What is the problem that this event intervention is trying to solve? Or what are we trying to increase or make better? Um, and from that, that is where your learning outcomes come from. And that's where your training material comes from. Because all of a sudden, we can be writing sales training for a customer service team that don't sell anything. And, you know, all different things can go a bit off piste. And then learners can leave saying, I don't really know why I've done that. It was great. I enjoyed it. Great fidget toys. But I don't really know what I've taken from it with regards to my job role. Lisa, what I've got for you is the debate continues as to whether the education system truly fosters creative and critical thinkers or does it predominantly focus on memorization of content? Um, I mean, we need a whole other hour if we're going to go into the education <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, having, come, having worked in education, 
been a school governor um, and I had uh, a child with special needs go through the education system. I've got a lot to say on that, but I think um, I think my answer is no. <laughs> it doesn't foster creativity, um, particularly mainstream schools. A lot of it is crowd control these days. Um, I, I do think I do think one thing that the education system does well is give um, children a really good insight into a very wide array of topics. So I think. You know, it gives everybody a really good foundation to think about all these different things. But I don't think it's kept up with, with the world that we live in. I mean, I know um, I know a 13 year old that's making seven grand a month from something called drop shipping because they learn how to do it on TikTok. You know, and um, and then you look at, you know, he goes into a classroom and they're teaching, you know, the same um, to catch. What, what's that book to capture? Uh you know, the book, I'm sure you'd have studied it in GCSE as well. I can't remember what it's called now, but it's exactly the same syllabus that I studied in GCSE English, and they're still studying it now. And Inspector Calls, that's the one. I don't know why I was thinking catch something. Um, but yeah, they're still studying like an Inspector Calls, and it's, you know, the world's moved on, and um, I don't think that um, the curriculum has moved on. I think there's a, a lot of really good teachers who really want to do some cool, radical stuff, but I think having a national curriculum that's led by a very old-fashioned institute doesn't do us any favours really. Um, I'd like to see a lot more of the Scandinavian model of education which is that the education is based around the community and the community needs um, and they do a lot more forest school and a lot more kind of practical vocational learning. I, I was at a, a meeting with, um, and this is a few years ago now, at Dundee University and they were doing a trial with the secondary school about um, the curiosity learning plan so they had this school set up in a way where people could just go lounge together, chat together and stuff like that. Now, all the kids knew what the syllabus was and what the quizzes were going to be, but you were allowed to study how you want, study when you want, chat when you want and stuff like that. And, and sort of they did this experiment to see how people would sort of progress through. And it really did. It really had some good results. And, and I didn't see it all the way through to the end. So it was only sort of... Um, mock you know midway through year exams and stuff like that and they were all above or around national average there was nothing outlying there but they were more curious they were more interested they were more creative in terms of how they learn and it's it's interesting isn't it because i'm a big fan of how primary schools teach the basic maths english and how to write and and, and they build some basic foundations that we all need um and then it's like secondary school is more curiosity and there's more options there's more wide range of things and it's how do we ensure critical thinking how do we ensure research how do we build those types of skills in now and i think that's probably where the next change probably needs to come in in education systems and, and you know even in qualifications like this which is a an hr qualification is a research-based qualification but it still follows the same assessment principles of you will write your answer within a fixed number of words you will use references you will use this style and uh, it still fits within the same sort of box so it's, it's interesting yeah there's um in scandinavia they do topic based learning so instead of having a maths lesson an english lesson and a this lesson that you have a topic and within that topic you learn all those skills naturally mm. Um, which would have suited i mean my, my son who's autistic you know is mad into dinosaurs if they'd have had a topic you know, a year on dinosaurs, he'd have learned, you know, all the maths from how many million years old there were, all the English from how to do all their names and probably the Latin versions. And, you know, I think that that kind of learning where you've got somebody's interest and you can spark that curiosity and, you know, keep them engaged through that kind of topic that they're interested in anyway. My nephew's also um, autistic. This uh, same into dinosaurs can tell you how to pronounce every single one. I'm looking at our paper, but he knows because he watched it, he's interested, he's watched YouTube videos on it, he's, he's curious. Yeah. And, and that, that's, I think, where we need to go, isn't it? It's, it's enhancing curiosity. Um, Lee, an unpopular one for you is the focus on hustle culture and side money is stopping people from mastering their, their key um, work-based skill because people are trying to focus on trying to generate money on the side and... Lisa used it where someone's like, it's actually working well, drop shipping or selling things on Etsy and, and everyone's trying to sort of get some side money in as opposed to focusing on accelerating their career and it's creating a skills gap is an opinion that's on this. I don't actually have the source for it here. What do you think about that? 
I mean, firstly, I'm glad my question wasn't about dinosaurs, which is where I thought this was going at the start because I could not answer that. What's question. your favourite dinosaur? <laughs> the one with the arms, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the green one. <laughs> um, it was carved for me as a child, not a dinosaur, I'm afraid. So I, I can't really help you with that. Yeah, that's that one. <laughs> um, so um, what was the question? Side hustles. Um, yeah. I it is a problem to be honest with you and actually I think this is a challenge for us as uh, HR professionals isn't it I think if we want someone to be um, committed to the business that we're working in to that organization um, then we've got to work at that otherwise if they can see they they can make seven grand a month through doing drop shipping off they go they're going to do it why wouldn't they I don't blame them um, if you want to get that information for me Lisa as to how I can do that that would be uh, much appreciated I'll split it with you 2080 split it's all about um, it. <laughs> Um, but I think what's probably really important there, um, this might be a bit of an unpopular one, but I think what's really important there is the values of a business um, and someone feeling really aligned to those values of the business. When I say the values, I don't mean as in, you know, our sort of our brand behaviours, like, you know, we keep our promises and we act with integrity and things like that. I mean, what is the purpose of the business? Um, I worked for a power station before, which sounds possibly a little bit dull, but actually what they were doing in the sustainability space was incredibly not dull. And I will promote that business forever and ever because what they did um, in terms of taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere was incredible. Um, you know, they've been on TV loads of times because of the research work that they're doing. And yes, there's going to be profit in, the, in them for that, but um, they weren't doing it for the profit. They were doing it because it was the right thing to do. Um, I worked um, in the past for a coffee company um, which again, I mean, doesn't sound dull because we're all hyped up on caffeine. But uh, again, that was all around sustainability, around um, improving the, the lives of farmers. And I could look at that little coffee capsule and think this is just you know a semi-luxury product. But actually, I look at the coffee capsule and I think this is helping farmers in developing countries' lives. Um, and that was the purpose of that business. So I think, what is the purpose of the business? What are we trying to achieve here? And I think that's really going to anchor people um, and get their commitment to that business. Um, where if there's easy money to be made elsewhere, if they're not anchored to that business, off they're going to go and make the easy money elsewhere. I know I would. Yeah, I, I think you're completely right. And, and, and people who see how their role impacts the what won the business, how it connects to everything, how they're a vital cog within the machine. If, if people feel like a number, then they're going to try and make that number in elsewhere. Mm. You know, if, if I'm just a paycheck, well, can I make that paycheck for an easier path? And it kind of makes sense. But for everyone who's catching us towards the end, we have covered the importance of learning, traditional classroom learning, and we've given some of our favorite classroom sessions. We've talked about online learning and e-learning, experiential and hands-on learning, uh, as well as self-directed and lifelong learning. Thank you very much to Lee and Lisa for giving me your insights into it and for joining me this evening to talk it through. Um, this has been Let's Talk HR. And we will catch you on the next one. Take care.